Welcome. I'm very excited all of you guys are joining us. This is webinar number four. This is a case study which we are publicly building and launching a product on Amazon and we're going to take it to a million dollars in revenue. Today I have on Mark Karish who is a patent attorney. Hi, I'm Mark Karish. I'm a patent attorney in California and uh, I'm going to talk to you today about you know how to protect your, your own ideas and how to avoid infringing uh, other people. And so there are three basic types of intellectual property protection that come into play here. There's trademarks and kind of a subset of that called trade dress. There's copyright and there are patents. And so I'm going to kind of quickly go through each of them. And let me just clarify that I'm not giving legal advice here. You know, basically, uh, most situations are kind of unique and they're factually specific. And honestly, some of this stuff is tricky. And so if you have uh, you know, questions about things or concerns, you should consult a, an attorney, okay? So let me break it down a little farther. I'm gonna, I wanna talk about the different kinds of trademarks. I wanna talk about how to search for them so you can find other people's uh, marks. And kind of, I wanna talk about the strength of different marks if, in case you're thinking of a mark for yourself and your product. And um, let me roll along with that. So trademarks, uh, you're familiar with many different ones, Apple, Nike, Adidas, uh, Exxon, all of these different trademarks. Uh, some of them have words, including the names of people. Some of them have geographic terms like West Coast Auto Body. Um, some of them are just the two letter marks, AAA, stuff like that. Some of them are slogans, uh, just do it, for example. Some of them are symbols. Some of them are uh, you know, different colors. Um, and another one, that I think you should be aware of is trade dress. And I'm gonna go through and give some examples in a minute of, of what some of these different things are. So um, here's an example of one that is a word mark, white elephant are the words part, and those can be a separate trademark or they can be with this elephant here. And so this is a combination word and symbol mark. Um, Here's another one, and this one kind of gives an example of trade dress. So trade dress is product shape that has been used long enough and kind of highlighted by the owner long enough that people have come to associate that um, shape with that company. So Coca-Cola and the Coca-Cola bottle are kind of the, uh, one of the most well-known of the, of the trade dress uh, trademarks. And so um, the trade dress can be formally registered with the Patent and Trademark Office, or it doesn't have to be, and somebody can still allege that a shape has come to be associated with them. So um, you just need to be aware of this type of trademark. Um, so you want to try to avoid infringing somebody else's trademark, right? So if someone else has a name of a business um, or a product, you do not want to select a trademark that is confusingly similar to that. So um, let me show you um, kind of how to find other people's trademark registrations. So the place to go do this is the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, okay? So you go to USPTO.gov and you, uh, you click, there are all these different menus, you go to trademarks, and under trademarks, it says search trademark database. And that is the TESS system, the trademark electronic search system. And in there, you can do different types of searches. You can just search for a, a, a basic trademark like Nike, you can just pull that one up. There are a lot of trademarks and then you can click on one, open it up and you can see that the mark Nike is been registered for use here with eyewear, sunglasses, etc. And you can see who the owner is. And so um, what you're trying to do in searching for trademarks is to make sure that the mark that you want to use with your product is not confusingly similar to an existing trademark. And so the, there's, the courts over the years have struggled with how, you know, the proper test for whether it's likely to cause confusion. And they look to a bunch of different factors, including how similar the marks 
look to each other, how similar they sound to each other. So for example, you're not gonna avoid the Nike trademark by adding a second K or adding a C to it or whatever. And it's just gonna be very, uh, and then they also look at um, how similar the goods and services are that the two different marks are used with, how sophisticated the likely customers are, how uh, cheap or expensive the products are. Um, several tests like that to figure out whether they're confusingly similar. So again, if you're going to adopt a new trademark for your product, you're gonna wanna go here and you're gonna wanna search to make sure that nobody's using the exact same mark with similar goods or services. So um, this is where it gets a little bit dicey and this is where um, you might need a, you know, there's some advantage to having a searcher or a lawyer get involved. Um, you want to make sure that there are no phonetic equivalents that are registered, you know, some slight misspellings that are registered. And um, let me pull this back up. So the other thing that you should do in addition to USPTO.gov, which we just talked about, was you can also just go to Google and Google the term that, that you're thinking of using in connection with what you're thinking of using it with and see what pops up there. Now, unfortunately, the US Patent and Trademark Office isn't the only place where people protect trademarks, which is why it gets a little bit tricky. You can have some trademarks that are registered with the states and sometimes people don't ever register them, but they've been using them for a long time and so they can still assert them against you. So I just don't want you to walk away thinking that, oh, look, I did a search on the USPTO.gov website and I didn't find the exact same mark for use with the exact same goods, so I'm okay. But that is definitely a starting point to make sure that what you're using is not gonna be infringing the trademark rights of anybody else. So um, the other complicating factor where you may wanna get someone else involved is a symbol. If what you're using as a trademark is not just a word mark, but a symbol, you may struggle a little bit to uh, search for that because you can't just type in the words. And so you might, again, want to engage someone to help you with that. You certainly can do some searching for symbol marks, but it is a little bit trickier, okay? Also, just a, a very brief mention of things to think about when you're selecting your own trademark. You, um, there's, there are different, um, there are different types of marks and they have different strengths. And so um, the strongest marks are the fanciful and arbitrary marks. And what we mean by that, for example, uh, a fanciful mark is Xerox. It's a made up word and has nothing to do with anything. And so that's a very strong mark. Likewise, uh, the mark Apple for use with computers is a, it's an arbitrary mark. It, it, it's a real thing, but it has nothing to do with computers. And then a suggestive mark is something like uh, chicken of the sea. Uh, a descriptive mark is something like uh, bufferin for aspirin. Uh, Surnames are things like Gallo for wine. Um, geographic marks are things like Atlantic for the magazine. And then um, generic marks are not protectable. So again, if you look at this list, fanciful and arbitrary is the strongest and it starts going weaker, weaker. So you get to generic. Generic are things like uh, elevator, aspirin, etc., And those are not protectable because those are terms that everybody uses to describe the actual products, okay? So there's my brief uh, explanation of trademarks to you guys. And again, um, just, just to clarify, the philosophy behind trademarks is actually to protect the marketplace. So we want consumers to be able to identify the source of the particular goods and services that they're buying. And so um, they prevent others from using a confusingly similar mark, but they don't prevent other people from selling the exact same goods. They just have to sell it under a clearly different mark. So um, anyway, there you go on trademarks. Maybe you guys will have some questions for me in the, in the chat that I can answer later. But again, this goes to the name of the product that you're, that you're selling and making sure that you don't step on anyone. The next thing I wanna talk about uh, is copyright law. 
So copyright, I just want to kind of quickly go over what it is and what's protected. Um, so uh, copyright uh, covers things like photographs, pictures, and the text that people use in advertisements, the, the text, pictures, photographs, and things they use in their product manuals. Um, this is the kind of thing where if you copy somebody else's packaging or you copy their, their product manual or whatever, this is where you get into trouble. It's in copyright law, okay? So um, copyright law automatically provides someone with protection. So if you, again, are inspired by someone else's product, um, you should know that they automatically have protection in the marketing materials they use, in the text of those materials, in the images, and in their, uh, you know, in other aspects of their packaging. And so uh, they don't have to register it with the Copyright Office. It's automatic. And if you copy those things, they can come after you, okay? Um, you can optionally see a notice there, you know, the, the name of the owner of the, of the copyright and the year, but, um, they don't have to put that on there. And the other thing that's optional is that it can be registered with the Copyright Office, but it, it doesn't have to be. Um, the philosophy, actually, it's okay, we'll just move on. You don't need to know the philosophy behind copyright law. The, the, let me just keep it going. The term of the copyright is very long. It's at least the life of the author plus 70 years. So, and in some cases it's longer, but you should know that again, for any product packaging or manuals or things that you're likely to be looking at, chances are it's still protected, okay? Um, the easiest way to avoid copyright infringement, don't copy it. Independent creation is okay. Obviously, if you have your own pictures, even if they're remotely similar to somebody else's pictures, as long as you created them, that's okay. Make up your own text. Don't take the shortcut uh, of copying other people's stuff. The other thing you should know is that if you have someone other, you know, from outside of your business help you create marketing materials or brochures or, um, you know, other materials, pamphlets, leaflets, anything that, that accompanies your product, and those are produced like under contract for you, you should definitely have those people assign all of their copyright in that, in the products they've made for you to you in writing. Again, written assignment of all copyrights uh, is essential so that uh, you don't have a dispute with that person down the road and then they come after you saying you're infringing, okay? So that's the, the very quick and easy thing for avoiding copyright infringement, okay? So the, the last big area that I wanna talk about today uh, is patent law. So um, the premise of patent law, and this is really uh, to protect the ideas behind products. And so um, I'm focusing today on uh, patents in the United States. The, um, there's no really a worldwide patent, although there are groups of countries that kind of have a group patent process. I'm not going anywhere near that with this presentation today. Okay, so the, for what you should know, patents, uh, have a term of either 17 years from from issuance or 20 years from the filing date, depending on how old the patents are. A good rule of thumb uh, is to just, again, guesstimate the longer of those two time periods, 17 years from issuance or 20 years from filing. Um, for patents filed today, it's 20 years from filing, but there was a there's a weird transition period. So the philosophy behind patents is simply that we you know, in exchange for you telling us about your useful, new, non-obvious invention, we're gonna give you a monopoly for a limited amount of time to use your invention and exclude other people from using it. And then after that time, the whole public is able to use it, right? So that is the, 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 the bargain behind patents. It goes all the way back to the constitution of this country. So um, with that background, let me talk a little bit about um, the types of patents, what constitutes infringement, and how to avoid infringement, okay? So um, utility patents, there are two types of patents. They're utility, well, there are more than two, but I'm gonna talk about two today. Utility patents and design patents, okay? So utility patents protect the sub, they, they protect the function or the features of a product and uh, the scope is defined by the claims at the end of the document. I'm gonna show you what 
that is. But um, let me also return to one other thing when I see the, the term is up there. As I said before, it's 17 years from issuance or 20 years from filing, whichever is longer, but the term may be shorter under certain circumstances, uh, certainly for utility patents. The way utility patents work is that you have to pay a maintenance fee, and if somebody doesn't pay each of the three maintenance fees, then the application does expire. I mean, the patent expires due to non-payment. So um, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later when we talk about patent searching, but you're gonna wanna, if you find a patent of, of concern, you're gonna wanna check to make sure that it's even still in force, not just because it's too old, but because somebody didn't pay the maintenance fee, okay? Um, so uh, this is what a utility patent looks like. Um, it might be a little bit hard to see here, so let me, uh, pull up a little bigger version of it for you. So, okay, so here is the, is an example of a utility patent. So you can see right here when it was filed, you can see right here when it issued. So this could help you in calculating the, the term of the patent. Also, I mentioned that a patent could be a little bit shorter. It is all also possible for newer patents because they're 20 years from filing that there was a delay on the part of the patent office. And in that case, the patent office can allow the term to actually go slightly beyond the 20 years from filing, okay? So again, it's gonna be important to look at these various dates of filing, issuance, and whether there's been any extension. Also, again, we're getting into a little bit of, of nuance here, but the, not nuance, but just extra detail. Sometimes a patent is linked to a prior patent in what they call a terminal disclaimer. And in that case, the term of the patent is the same as the term of this underlying patent. And so if you, this example doesn't have it, but you may see something where it'll say, subject to the terms of a terminal disclaimer, um, the expiration date is this. So um, it, it becomes sometimes important to know if there's a disclaimer. So anyway, that's probably more detail than you need there. But so this is a utility patent. And as I said, utility patents are really defined by claims and the claims are at the end. And we frequently say that this is kind of like a property deed where it talks about what the, uh, the protection covers. So if you look down here, you'll see the following is claimed, and then you'll read the various things that make up the thing that is being claimed. And in this case, it's a portable soap dispenser. It has to have a housing, a reservoir, and just several things have to be in it for it to, uh, be, to be infringed, right? So you're looking to make sure if you have a soap dispenser, you want to make sure that your soap dispenser doesn't have every single one of these things. Now, sometimes these are written in legal ease. It's a little bit challenging to interpret the language of the claim. And so again, I would tell you, if you find something that you're concerned about and you're struggling to interpret it, then you may want to talk to a lawyer. And again, there are certain things that in influence how the patents are interpreted and it just gets to be kind of tricky. But just so to, to simplify this a little bit, when you're looking to see if you're infringing a patent, what you want to look at are what we call the independent claims. So claim one is always independent. It, it doesn't, it just stands all by itself. If you look at claim two, claim two is what we call a dependent claim, which is, you know, the portable soap dispenser of claim one that also has something else. And so if you look at all of these claims, they're all dependent. And so for the sake of the analysis to see if you're infringing, you want to look at the independent claims first. If you don't infringe an independent claim, then you don't have to worry about the dependent claims because the dependent claims are basically the independent claim plus something else. So again, for the sake of looking at infringement, you're going to want to look at the independent claims. And if you don't infringe those, you should be okay. So again, that is uh, utility patents. And now let me roll on here and talk briefly about design patents. So design patents protect the appearance of a product and the scope of the patent. Uh, let me back up. So a design patent is much, oh, you know, I'll just pull up the sample one. 
Here is a sample design patent. Again, maybe it's hard. Let me pull up an actual version of it so you can see it. So a design patent is defined by a bunch of drawings, and the drawings show the product from all different angles, from the top, from the bottom, from the front, from the back, from the sides. And so the drawings are what actually define the scope of a design patent, okay? Um, they are frequently obtained for things like um, automotive wheel designs and shoe designs and things of that nature, but it's not exclusive to those. And it's possible that someone will have filed a design patent that covers a product that you're thinking of making. And so, um, so design patents have a little bit different term than utility patents. Design patents, they last 14 or 15 years from when they um, issue. And um, again, you should assume at least 14 years from issuance. There are no maintenance fees. There, so these actually last that amount of time, okay? So um, let me clarify. So for the sake of both utility and design patents, um, what you're not allowed to do is make, use, sell, offer for sale, import, or export the patented invention unless you have authorization, such as a license from the patent owner, okay? You want to try to avoid infringement of other people's patents. So how do you go about doing that? The first thing to do is to do a search to try to find any patents that may cover the product that you are thinking of making. Um, so um, if, you, if you know that someone else has a product, then you should definitely look at their product, their packaging, their uh, website, and see if they have any information about their patents on there. They don't always have that information. So, so I just showed you a couple of patents by this company, Simple Human. So you can look on here, and there's the soap dispenser. We just saw some patents directed towards soap dispensers. And you can look on this website, and you can, you can actually go look at the, at the soap dispenser and you won't see any information on here about their any patents. So that's not enough though, to conclude that you have nothing to worry about, okay? So it's still a great first place to look. You should definitely look at the product, the packaging and the website, but um, that might not always be helpful. They don't always mark their products and that doesn't mean that you're home free and so, the next place, to, so the next thing to do is to do some searching, right? So one place to do it, um, let me kind of do the easier one first, which is patents.google.com, okay? And so this one here is Google Patents, okay? And you can search by the name of a company. You can search by the, the kind of the, the nature of what it is that you're thinking of doing. So let's just do simple human again. We'll just, here there's a bunch of, of patents that come up, but it's not, it's not particularly helpful. So what we want to do is be more specific. Maybe we want to change it so that the assignee is a known name, simple human or whatever it is. And so um, now we can just bring up a list now of simple humans patents. So again, you can search by assignee, you can search by, you can limit it to patents that are new enough to cause you a problem. You don't need patents from the 19th century. They're long expired. Um, maybe you want to look at some old patents to see, you know, you're allowed to do what's in old patents. So maybe you want to look to see if there's an old idea that's the patents have expired and you want to do that idea. You can also limit the priority date here. So, um, and again, there are more fields. You can look up a particular inventor. So if you know the name of a particular person who got a product, you can look for it there. You can, um, again, you can search design patents or utility patents separately. Um, again, this is just a very good search tool to quickly locate patents that may be relevant to you. When you get to one that you're interested in, you click on it and then you can download the actual patent you can see down here the legal status. Sometimes they, they have the status, it expired for whatever reason. Someone didn't pay the fee, it's too old, whatever reason. Um, so this can be helpful. I'm gonna show you in a minute the patent office website and 
you can also check the status there as well. And that, I think, may be a little more accurate and a little more definite um, as a kind of a, a double check here. So um, anyway, so there's Google Patents. Um, Another thing that may be helpful to you is if you find a similar uh, patent or a similar product that's on here, you can look at what was what other patents cited to it. And so like the patent we're looking at now is old, but a bunch of much newer patents cited to it. So then you can just kind of follow the chain and look at things that sound interesting. So. Excuse me, that's So, Mark, real quick, would you yeah. cite to it if you uh, were saying, like, it doesn't infringe their patent? Or when would you cite to it? Because I've seen that before, and I was curious what's that, what that is. What do you mean, oh, cite to it? Like, why, did, why is it in there? So, yes. okay, so, like, this first patent citations, if you look at the patent, it's this random patent. I don't even know what we're looking at, but let me just grab it really quick. See all of these at the beginning of it? These are references cited. So these are all the things that the person who applied for the patent brought to the attention of the patent office. So that's what, that's what, um, that's what patent citations refer to. And then cited by means that this patent was cited in the later patents. So like maybe during the examination of a later patent, the examiner found the one that we're looking at, and that might be relevant because perhaps the uh, the the more recent patent is still applicable to us, and it's slightly it's it's more relevant for whatever reason. Like, the typical example we always use is suppose there's a patent that teaches a chair with three legs. Well, 20 years later, somebody files a patent for a chair with four legs. Well, chances are that patent on a chair with three legs was cited against that later patent. And so if your, um, if your product is a chair with four legs, you might take a look at this old three-legged one and go, I don't have anything to worry about. But in reality, someone got a later one on a chair with four legs. Or maybe they got one on a chair with four legs and two arms, or four legs, two arms, and a headrest, or whatever it is. So this is just kind of a way to do some searching yourself. Um, as I'm gonna explain, it's there's still peril there um and again you can search under google and on the u.s patent and trademark office not just by you can search by subject matter so for example i know uh well i'm not sure if we if you guys have discussed the subjects of the products you're considering for your uh test product but um again yeah, we are so like one of our test products is like a baby hooded towel yeah so you could just put hooded towel in here and see what comes up. And so here is a hooded garment for drying a baby. Okay. And this is a utility patent. It, design patents have a D at the beginning of the number. So this is a utility patent. This one, you can immediately see it, it's expired. So you don't have to worry about this one, but you can look and see kind of what they claimed. And uh, you can then also go and see if it's been cited against anything else. So again, here are some more patents that have issued that at least cited to this one, they may be similar. So here's one that's remotely similar. Again, it too has expired. I think these are a little bit older luckily, but sorry to jump around everybody. But um, again, look in here, you can see some more uh, things that may be relevant here. Um, Okay, and since those are since that was a utility patent, if it was still, uh, if it hadn't expired, if it was still, whatever the term is, current. Um, yeah. Since it's a utility patent, that's kind of like all encompassing for like a hooded towel. So I couldn't just make it like a few inches wider and longer. It would still like infringe on that patent. Patent, generally speaking, is that correct? Very likely, if the thing was still in force, you have to go take a look at the claim. So we're looking at claim one now. It has, you know, a body portion with these certain characteristics. It has uh, body enclosing members configured as wing-like flaps, and it has some other aspects to it. So you have to look at your product and compare it to these things. And this claim doesn't have dimensions on it, like you said, two inches wider or two inches narrower or whatever. Sometimes claims are limited in size. And in that case, yes, you might be able to get around it by, by doing something. 
So, I mean, that's what we call designing around is taking a look at the at the independent claims and saying, hey, do we have all of these elements? And if so, do we need all of these elements? What can we take out? What can we add? You know, how can we get around these things? So okay, great. And it has to have all of the claims to infringe on the patent. Is that correct? It has to have all elements of one claim to infringe on the one patent. claim. Okay. It only has to infringe claim one, for example. It doesn't have to infringe any other claim, and that's enough for somebody to sue you for again for making, using, offering it for sale, selling it, importing it, exporting it. They, I mean, they're you know, as long as you're doing any of those things without authorization for a product having the characteristics of claim one over here, then you are potentially at risk, assuming the cat the patent is in force, right? So. Um, do you have any more questions for me about this one? No, that's great, thank you. Okay, good. Um, and again, I assume people will write in if they have some more things they wanna talk about. Um, let me just get back to this here. So um, we talked about patents at Google. We can also talk about the USPTO.gov website. Let me go to that so you can see what it is. We already went to this website when we looked up the trademarks but now we're gonna to go to the patent side of this, okay? And so if you scroll down here, you can search for patents, okay? So there are, uh, you could just, you could search several different ways. If you know the name of the, the inventor, you know the name of, of the assignee, meaning who the inventor assigned the patent to. Um, so there are many ways to search on here. The other thing that I think is helpful sometimes is to go to this other part of the website, there's always a survey and always authentication. So you have to get used to that. So um, this other thing is called the PAIR, okay? The Patent Application Information Retrieval uh, Site. And so you can go on here and check the status of an app, of an application or of a patent. And that it brings me kind of to the next thing I wanted to bring up. So, so now we're gonna take a quick look at one of these patents that I showed you earlier. We'll look at the utility patent for the soap dispenser. And so it again will bring up uh, the, the patent information. And then you can also find out, because one of the things we haven't talked about yet is published applications or reasons that these searches are not foolproof. So luckily in this one, there are what they call no child applications. Sometimes you have people that get a patent and then they file related patent after related patent after related patent. And not all of those have issued as patents yet. Not all of those have even published yet always. So this is just another place to, to kind of go to find out the status of things, to find out uh, whether they've paid their, their money for the maintenance fees, you know, whether there are any related applications. So, um, so that's the USPTO.gov website. Let me, um, again, bring up, uh, we talked briefly about designing around, looking at the scope of the patent claims, okay? Um, let me explain why this is not perfect. Patent searching is a bit of an art, kind of like with the trademarks, where you have to worry about phonetic equivalents, slight misspellings, um, etc. Here, you're searching based on kind of a description of what it is, and you're, you know, you may not get that right and you may not, you just, there are limits on searching, right? The guys who do this are pretty adept at finding the search terms and kind of knowing where and how to look. And um, that's one issue. Another issue is that design patents don't, it, don't um, you can't see them until they issue. So somebody might have a design patent that's on file that's gonna issue in the next two weeks, but you wouldn't know. Right, so that's one limit. And then same with utility applications, they don't publish until typically 18 months after they file or until they issue. And so again, there could be something that's lurking out there that you aren't aware of even when you do searching, okay? So they're not, uh, it's not foolproof, it's not perfect, and there is risk there. And so I just want everyone to be aware of that. If you do your own searching, which I would recommend, I would recommend that you go to Google Patents and maybe just do a Google search for the type of product. But just because you didn't find it doesn't mean you're home free. And in fact, even if you get a searcher or a lawyer involved 
there is still limits on searching and searches are imperfect. Although again, I'd like to think that our searching is a little bit better, a, a, a more elaborate, et cetera. So um, let's say you find a patent that is a problem. You can't design around it easily. And so at that point, if your heart is absolutely set on making this product, and at this point, I will tell you, you should probably have spoken to a lawyer if you're, or speak, should speak to one before you keep going. You can try to determine whether that patent is valid, okay? And you might be able to reach a conclusion that, hey, the, this patent is never going to hold up in court. And, and the reason for that is that somebody made the same thing 25 years ago or whatever. This is kind of a difficult analysis, and it's still fraught with peril because until that patent is invalidated, either at the patent office or in a court, you can still be sued under it and you, it's expensive. So it's kind of a risky strategy, but um, again, if there is a patent of concern and you really wanna make a product and your, your heart's absolutely set on it, then you can consider whether to do a, a try to invalidate that patent, a validity study, okay? So um, again, when there's product out there, you're gonna wanna check the product, the packaging, their website. You're then going to want to go do your searching on Google and on uh, the U.S. Patent Office. But, um, oh, there's one more thing I should show you here that was on there that I missed, which is the assignment inventor search. So if you look at the Patent Office website and you go back to the patent main page here, let's see if we can do it. Try it again. Patents. So if you look on here, again, there is a thing called patents assignments, change in search ownership. So so here you look up by a certain patent number, you can look up by the name of an assignee. Um, so here you can see a list of all of these things that were assigned. Apparently there are other entities with the name Nike in them. So um, anyways, so that's an assignee search. The other thing I wanted to tell you about briefly um, was you're going to do a search and sometimes you're going to get issued patents and sometimes you're going to get published applications because in the ordinary course, unless an inventor uh, requests that it not be published, a patent application publishes after 18 months. So um, you're going to see those come up. Let me just go and I'll do a quick search again for the, for the hood towel and probably see one. So one second. Okay. So, um, here is a towel and this one is not an issued patent it's a pending application which means that or it's a published application which means that this is before it issued if it ever issued it published so you can see here um again it's a towel with a hood on it and some other things and maybe you want to make a product that looks a whole lot like this you've taken a quick look at the claims at the end and you've seen Hey, I, I have a lot of these, a lot of these features. Whatever happened with this? Well, this is when you're gonna go and look at the patent office website and see what the status is of, of this particular published application. It might let me just oh, I'm not seeing it. Sorry. Sorry right, to bounce quick, you all around. Yeah. yeah, no worries. This is awesome. Uh, how did you recognize real quick that that was a uh I guess a, a publication as opposed yeah. to uh, well, yeah, that's a good, that's a very good question. It's, it's very simple actually. So um, patent issued patent numbers are, are in the millions, like 5 million, 6 million. I think they're up to 9 million something now published applications have a year at the beginning, 2013, something 2014, 15, 16. Right? So um, if you see a year at the beginning of the number, you know, it's a publication. So, whatever happened with this publication, right? I want to find out. So I'm going to then go to this pair that we were on, this check the status, right? And we're going to go there and we're going to see, maybe I don't have to worry about this publication, right? Maybe it's, so you can search by publication number. So we'll go there and then we'll take out all the spaces and dashes and whatever, because it's very sensitive. And then let's see what happened. So this, published application ultimately issued as a patent. And so you now have the patent number and you should go and look at that patent because the claims may have changed in between. So we'll go back to Google Patents 
We'll put that number in there and we'll take a quick look at the towel and we'll see if the, if the claims changed at all. Um, trying to figure out the best way to do this <laughs> when we're sharing a screen. But um, anyway, this is how you do it, right? You see a publication of concern, you then go look at the status, see if it issued or see if it expired or it just went abandoned or whatever. And then you're also gonna wanna see, are there any related applications? Here, there are no related applications. So the only thing that we're really worried about is the one issued patent for the towel. Um, and then we're gonna look at that and see if we're potentially infringing it, okay? So um, I, let me also clarify, we talked quickly about the utility patent and the claims and making sure that your product doesn't have every element in each of one of the independent claims. But let me give you the test for design patents. Design patents, um, they're a little, they're easier to get, they don't take as long, they're cheaper, um, they're simply based on the drawings. And so um, what they really prevent is anyone from making something that's confusingly similar to what theirs looks like. So um, th again, I don't want you to be confused because we're looking at a utility patent, but if we were looking at a design patent, here's an example, you'd have to stay clear of this soap dispenser design, right? You would wanna make something that's never gonna be confused. And I'm kind of paraphrasing the language of the test, and it is subjective and an aggressive patent owner really could uh, aggressively try to enforce their design patent. So to avoid that, the best thing to do is make sure that you change the appearance of the product. Just significantly change it so that they don't really look that similar. And, and that's the easiest way to avoid a design patent. So again, design patents cover the appearance and that is easily changed, right, to avoid infringement. Utility patents cover the function or the features of the product, and those are a little bit more difficult. You have to carefully look at all of the different independent claims, and you have to carefully analyze whether or not any of those independent claims uh, are infringed. And again, if there's a question about uh, finding those patents that may be at issue or a question about analyzing whether those patents are infringed, you, your best bet is to talk to an expert, a patent attorney, and, and get their opinion on this before you invest a lot of time and money and you know before you, you have exposure. So um, anyway, th the last thing I will tell you is uh, if you're you know, an innovative and you've come up with the new product, you might want to consider getting a patent either on the, the look and feel of the product, which is a design patent, which again, prevents someone from just knocking off your product. Um, or you want to get a utility patent that covers your, no, your, your, your useful, novel, and non-obvious design, right? So the advantages to getting a patent are that you have exclusive rights in the product for some period of time. It allows you to capture market share and have bigger profit margins. And there's also some marketing benefit to, you know, touting your patented product. So um, anyway, I'm sorry that was a bit of a baton death march through uh, various types of IP protection, but hopefully this gave you at least some idea of the various uh, intellectual property protections that are in play and how to at least avoid some of them or find out whether you're at risk. So with that, I don't really have uh, much else in my presentation. I don't know uh, if there are some questions for me or. Yeah, I'm Mark, the, uh, the question box has been very full. I've tried to pull out a few that I think would pertain to the most people. Um, okay. So if you have a few minutes to answer, uh, yeah, so awesome. that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Um, so one question is, you know, I think a lot of us, uh, we're thinking about like what type of products to sell. Um, it's obviously very, um, quite an in-depth process to like know 100% whether there's a patent on a product or not. So is one way do you think that's like useful to figure out maybe even just like at first glance whether a product's patent is like if there's a whole bunch of other or if there's multiple sellers selling essentially like the same product, like especially on Amazon, is that usually safe to assume? Of course, there's no like 100% in your industry, uh, but is that usually like safe to assume that there wouldn't be a patent on that product? No, I wouldn't assume that. I, I would. Assume, I mean, again, I think what happens, there's a lag in this, right? I come up with a new product design. I file a patent application. It takes a little while to get through the patent office. But in the meantime, I'm not necessarily going to wait for that 
patent to get issued before I start selling it. So I might start selling my product now, and a bunch of people might knock it off immediately. As you guys know, it doesn't take long for others to be inspired by a, a good and successful product on Amazon. And so um, ultimately, though, the original person may get patents on those, and those uh, many other sellers may be infringing. And I certainly know of some scenarios where this, is, this, have, this has happened before, not just design patents, which again, don't publish until they issue, and utility patents, which take a little bit longer typically. And so, no, I, I, that's not a guarantee that there's no, no patent in play here. Okay, cool. Thanks for that answer. Um, another person, we have, um, I think about half of our uh, crowd is an international crowd. Uh, and they want to know, do you have to be a US, US citizen or a US corporation in order to register a trademark or a patent? Gosh, you know, I don't, I don't, for patents, definitely no. I, I don't, trademarks, I don't think so either, but I'm not 100% sure. Something's gnawing at me about it, but um, I, I don't think so. Okay, cool. Um, one person want to know, and this is probably more specific to copyright law, um, about how to say, for instance, someone copies our packaging, they ripped off, they copied and pasted all of our, um, our description or something like on our Amazon listing or anything else. How do you go about enforcing it? And like, I guess, how do you kind of decide when it is worth enforcing? Because obviously, well, go ahead. You no, um, this is a tricky issue. So you have rights in it, but your damages are limited. So unless you have a registration. So the safe thing to do is if you have uh, marketing materials or product materials, you should register them with the copyright office within a, a short amount of time after coming out with them, um, within three months of, of coming out with them, ideally. And then if you have a federal copyright registration, then you have some additional remedies about getting your attorney's fees back. And if there's willful infringement, there's different damages and there's what they call statutory damages. So I would say that the first thing to do would be to register that stuff. And then um, if you don't have a registration, your damages are more limited. You still can stop. You can make, you can get a court to make someone stop doing it, but you're not, you're, it, it may not, it may be an expensive thing to make that happen. And you have to calculate whether that's valuable. So again, if you have a registration, you have some more options here. Okay. And cool. registrations are actually fairly cheap. Honestly, you, you can do it yourself and it's, it's not that expensive a, a thing to register a, a copyright. So copyright.gov is the website. There are a bunch of, they have a bunch of helpful materials about what copyrights are and how to register them. So maybe that's a resource some people uh, would find helpful. Okay, great. And I know I asked you this question a little bit earlier, but I see there's still a bunch of questions about it. So let me ask it one more time. So to infringe on a patent, um, mm -hmm. do you need to copy kind of like all elements or is it just one element? Or can you kind of elaborate on that again? Yeah. So um, let me just pull up this. We're talking about utility patents. Oh, I forgot I'm not screen sharing. Give me a sec. So sure, no worries. Let me, let me pull the screen back up here. Um, so here's the patent again. Let's take a look at um, a claim that's a little bit easier to see, this claim 27. So claim 27 is an independent claim and it stands on its own. So if you have a product that meets every element of claim 27, you are infringing if you sell it, okay? Offer it for sale, import it, export it, like I said, all of those things. So um, again, you have to carefully look at your product and see, does it have a housing? Does it have a reservoir to store liquid soap? Does it have a fluid passage with those things? You lit, so if it meets every element of that claim 27, it doesn't matter if it meets any of the other ones. That's enough to be infringing. But if it doesn't have a gear pump, let's say, a gear pump assembly, or it doesn't have a motor, it's unmotorized, then it's not infringing claim 27. You still have to be sure that it's not infringing the other independent claims. So across the page is claim 16. It doesn't require a motor, right? So that claim still could be infringed. So that's why you have to take a look at all of the independent claims separately and see if you have every element of each of those claims separately. Like you just want to do, do a chart of claim 16 and then check to see if you have every one of those things. And if not, 
great, move on to claim 27 or whatever the next independent claim is, make a chart. And, and again, if you have all of the elements of any one claim, then you are potentially infringing. I think, you know, one of the things that happens also though, is you're gonna take a look at some of these claims and you're gonna say, well, gee, what is a uh, staging chamber? So that's where you're gonna have to go back, read the patent. Sometimes they're, they're drafted in kind of a tricky way. And if you have any questions about them, again, that's where you're gonna have to you know, get someone to help you, a patent attorney or patent agent or someone who you know, has a facility with these documents and can help you make that determination. All right, someone asked the question. I think I could probably help you with this one. Uh, is it reasonable to assume that if a product's for sale but from a reputable factory on Alibaba, we'll assume for the question that they're in China, would it be free of patent issues? And I don't know what Mark's uh, experience is with Alibaba, but uh, you know, it's a marketplace for Chinese factories. And my experience from this is, no, it's not safe to assume that because keep in mind that um, IP laws are much different in China and for lots of countries for that matter. Uh, they're very loose in China and there's no like legal ramifications or it's not even necessarily like against their business ethics um, to sell products that may be uh, patented, you know, to you or to someone else. Um, do you have anything to add on to that, Mark? I, 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 no, that's a, I think that's right, Greg. I think the, the bottom line is it's not just Alibaba, though. I think you have a situation where sometimes you will have a factory in China or a Chinese supplier saying, hey, you know, you can go ahead and make this and you have to do your own independent verification of that. And I don't think that a Chinese supplier is ever going to indemnify you when you get sued in the United States. There's, there's, it, they're not going to be out necessarily to help you. So this is something you need to do for yourself and make sure uh, that it's clear. Great. Um, another person asked a question about filing or um, patents in U.S., um, as well as other countries. So if they find a patent in the EU or another region, but nothing in the US, um, what do they need to be mindful of or looking out for in a scenario like that? So um, again, uh, I've only really covered US patents here. And so um, I don't, aside from any concerns they may have about selling the product into Europe or whatever, frequently if someone has an international patent like a European patent, there is often a US equivalent to that patent. And for example, let me go back to the screen share thing. Sometimes on Google, you will see international patents come up. Of course, they won't right now because that would be helpful to us, but um, oftentimes they will. Oftentimes international patents will have corresponding US patents. And so there are places to try to look for that. But again, on Google, hopefully if you can find the international patent. Uh, Google might show you some other related applications. If you know the, it, the name of the company or individual on that international patent, you can again search for those uh, individuals or companies using the Google patent search or using the patent office. And hopefully that will kind of give you a, a, an opportunity to, to make sure there's no related US application. If either you have a, a pending patent or someone else has a pending patent, um, can you speak again real quick to what type of protection you have during a patent pending? I guess we could assume that it does end up getting approved. Okay, so you actually can't get damages unless and until you ultimately get a, a an issued patent. The law is that if you have a published patent application with certain claims and ultimately a patent issues with those same claims in it or roughly equivalent claims, you can in theory get damages all the way back to the point of the published claims. But I don't know if anyone's successfully done that off the top of my head. I mean, it's, it's, in, it's theoretical and I guess it could happen. I just don't know if it's happened. But again, simply having a published application or patent pending doesn't allow you to stop someone else from doing something. You certainly have the right to tell people, hey, I have this patent application pending and just so you know if i get it i'm coming after you so and it's already published and if it comes and if it published if it issues with those same claims you're potentially liable from that day forward so um there is some some theoretical protection and it might discourage some people but in reality you cannot stop someone until you get an issued patent uh, but the last one is people were curious on just what kind of price structure to expect from you or another attorney uh maybe for 
uh, filing a patent application as well as like a patent or trademark ser search. I imagine it varies a lot, but I'll let you speak to that. Well, it does vary a lot. Let me um, let me speak a little bit to you know trade. Well, we talk about trademarks, copyrights, and patents. Copyrights are pretty inexpensive. The, the filing fees are pretty limited. Um, trademarks also again we we help people select trademarks and register trademarks all the time those are usually about a grand including the patent office filing fees that are typically 275 bucks for one class of goods right if you want to use your trademark with a whole bunch of different types of products it's a different price structure but and then um with patents that's a little bit different it depends on the uh, the type, the technology involved, but for simple products, usually searching is, I would say, between two and three grand or so. And then I would say applications to get them on file are typically between 7,500 and 9,000 or so. Um, and then we typically tell people to budget 50 to 100% of the filing costs to get it through the patent office, because oftentimes you have to, there's a lot of give and play with the examiner. And so um, that's just for rough budgeting purposes. And so 7,500 bucks at the low end, th there's typically drawings that have to be done. There's typically patent office. The patent office costs vary depending on how large the company is that's filing the patent application. So um, that is a rough estimate for you guys. And obviously if there was a particular uh, instance, we could give very, you know, our firm does this stuff all the time. We could give exact quotes to people, but that's a, a rough guess. So thank you everyone for joining us. Mark, I'm gonna give a big thanks to you. That was uh, very useful. I know I learned a lot. Uh, I think the listeners did, did as well because I see just about everyone stayed till the very end. Um, and guys, if you're following along with our case study, the next session is going to be this Wednesday. Uh, this Wednesday, I'm going to talk about which factories I've contacted on Alibaba, what kind of responses I've gotten from them, and how we're going to go about uh, getting samples and kind of the next phases of uh, the million dollar case study. So, hey, thank you for having me and thank you everybody for listening to me. And, uh, you know, good luck to everybody. All right. All right. Take care. Bye bye. All right. You do. Bye bye.